I'm sorry. <laughs> the scripture reading is from Genesis book 3, verses 6 through 9. It may be found on page 2 of the Old Testament. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of the evening prairies. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? This is the word of God for the people of God. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to welcome everyone here joining us in worship today as we are gathered to praise and listen to the Word of God. I also want to welcome everyone who is here and our first new, new uh, first time worshipers. We are glad that you're here with us. We would like to continue to connect with you. So if you would kindly uh, write, uh, fill up a connection card, we will be in touch and we hope that we will be able to share our story together. I want to welcome everyone who is tuning online. We welcome you wherever you are. We miss you and we hope that we will get to see you again. And all our members at Rally Court Rehabilitation Center, we're praying for your well-being. We're praying that you will be able to continue to focus your eyes onto our Lord. And I wanted to thank everyone who is joining us in worship and also helping us in leading the worship as well. As we are going through a time of exploring how we can answer the question that was asked by God to us. So with that in mind, I want to ask us to join in a time of prayer so we can focus our hearts to our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we are thankful for this time that we come together Focus our hearts onto you. Open up our eyes, open up our souls and our hands so we can see what you say to us. And as we hear your voice, may we be able to respond with an amen, respond for your mission, and respond to continue to walk with you. May the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be worthy in front of you, my Lord, my rock, my Savior, and my everything. And may you be glorified in all that we do. We pray this all in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So during the summer, for next nine weeks, we will go through a sermon series called The Question God Asks Us. And this is based on a book that is written by Trevor Hudson. And the premise of this book is going through the stories of the Bible, especially the familiar stories that we all know, but instead of asking what we want from God, asking what God is asking for us. Because a lot of the times what we do is we tend to go to the Bible as a quick fix. You might all have your favorite Bible verses, and I do have one too, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. I, I, I also love Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, 7. And I can go on and on with all the verses that I like. And those are the verses, yes, in the times of difficulties that I will hold on to. But a lot of the times, by us coming to the Bible in that kind of manner of trying to figure out what God, instead of what asking what God asks for us, and trying to figure out how God is going to be with us, and trying to find it as a quick fix for us to continue on on our own ways, this book is saying that we might be missing out on something. Because the Bible is not for us to pick and choose on certain verses that we like. The Bible is for us to look into the entirety of who God is, and through that understanding, we are to be in communion with God. So there are times in the Bible that it will be difficult and those are the parts that we might have to wrestle with and ask, why in the world did God say this? And as we wrestle and as we continue to dive onto the Word, through that effort of us coming into the Word, what happens is that we are able to figure out and find God's ways. So we have to talk about how and the way that we read the Bible. 
Instead of reading it in a way of picking and choosing what I like and what I want to hear, there's a lot of the times the Bible we have to come to the Word and really meditate on figuring out what God has to say to us. Therefore, what we need, we need to start with the word of prayer, asking us to go into and asking for the wisdom of God because the Holy Spirit and the gift of the Holy Spirit also contains a wisdom, a belief and wisdom for us to understand what God is saying to us. But that does not happen until we yield unto the Spirit. That's why we ask for the Spirit and we ask us to open our hearts for us to receive the Spirit and to understand what God is telling us. But also as we do that, we also need to do is we need to find a way to chew on to that word. In Joshua chapter 1, God says, meditate on the word day and night. And that word meditate, if you look at to the original verse, is more like chewing on to the word. So the way, best way to describe it as Eugene Peterson had done in his word, uh, in his book, Eat My Book, he says, the best way to understand that word is if you see your dog chewing on a bone. Right? Chewing and chewing and chewing and even to a point that bone melts and you lick and it comes and it completely be consumed in, his, in her body. That is the way that we should look into the word. But what do we do? We don't because it's too hard for us to chew on. It's too hard for us to fully understand. And so many times because we are not able to let go of our will instead of seeking God's will, we tend to push the Bible away. The Bible cannot be comprehended until we completely lay down our own thoughts, our wills, and even our understanding. And it's when we lay down, we are able to hear what God says. And by doing that, that process actually leads us to perfection. That's why John Wesley, in his sermon, preface, pre preface of sermons of several occasions, this is how he opens. He says, oh, give me that book at any price. Give me the book of God. I have it. Here is the knowledge enough for me. Let me be homo unius liberi. What does this mean? A man of one book. Now, I'm not saying that we should all go and burn our other books, but it just shows the weight of how much Wesley puts into the time and the effort of understanding God's words. Like I said, Wesley was a person who would read other books, but he put the weight onto it for him to really understand God's will. He continues on by saying, Here then I am, far from the busy ways of men. And I keep on going back onto the busy ways of men. Wesley was a person a couple hundred years ago, and he said he was busy. I would laugh at him when he says he was busy. But as a person who was busy, he had to sit down alone. Only God is here in his presence. I open, I read his book. For this end, to find the way to heaven. And also shows how Wesley was all about perfection of faith. Thou hast said, if any be willing to do thy will, he shall know. I am willing to do your will. Let me know your will. And that is how we are to approach the Bible. We are to approach the Bible not in a way of saying, I want a quick fix. We are to approach the Bible in a saying, Lord, what do you have to say to me? And that's the journey that we'll walk on. Terry just told me that this is the last copy we have. There's still more coming in this week. So if you tell her she will be able to make sure that this will come to your and if you can put it as a summer reading that will be great so we will go to a familiar story that we all know a story about the original sin the story that we so often use to guilt everyone sitting in the pews the story that we also misuse to say that this is woman's fault instead of the man this is a misuse because everyone the, the man and the woman had the same part in this act 
But the original sin, when we talk about it, we see a God who is harsh, who will condemn us for what we had done wrong. Another thing that we see in the original sin is that we so often use the original sin and we focus on to what we had done. So we focus on to the behaviors. So when you are asked, and when you were actually introduced to the story a couple decades ago, when you were asked to repent all your sins, can I ask how many of you repented of your sin, of your heart, instead of the sins that you had done? A lot of us, it's more about what we had done. Lord, I'm sorry that I did not do this. Sorry that I missed a Sunday. Sorry that I did this. Sorry that I drank. Sorry that I... That was, that was all we had learned. Because our thought of repentance and repentance was focused more onto our behaviors. But what happens when we become Christians and we become a little bit mature, that we don't do any stupid things? We still do stupid things, but it's not doesn't come with any kind of consequences than we did before. What happens? We might fall into a trap thinking that we are all good. That actually can carry on a little bit more saying that as long as I do good in this world, I can compensate and counterbalance all the bad things I've done before. So I don't need to go to church. And that's how we see original sin and the story. But if you go into the story, the story has never been about a behavior. The story was all about the heart. Because God said, if you eat from that tree, you will die. Did they die? No. They ate it. But it was more about their heart and their dismiss disobedience. The original sin is more about our heart of are we willing to follow God's will? Are we continuing to following our own ways? And that's a battle that we all have right now. Even the point of not being able to read the Bible is because we want to follow our ways and our experiences instead of following God's will. We interpret the Bible in that way that will fit my will instead of God's will. And in a way, we are still susceptible of this original sin. And it's not for me to put you in guilt. It's for me to remind us, including me, that this whole journey is about how we follow God in this journey. So as you all know, there is a serpent who came, and Adam and Eve both ate from this. And this is what happened in the eyes of Eve. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 to 7, it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to her eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her. It's an interesting part. He was there with her from the beginning even when she was talking with the serpent. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made lion claws uh, for themselves. So what happened is when they had ate this fruit, that God said, you will die from it. They did not die at that moment. And a lot of people would say, then why did God say that they will die? It's like me telling my son, if you watch TV that long, you're going to become dumb. <laughs> Is he really going to be dumb by watching TV? As a matter of fact, he's watching all this YouTube with information, and it seems like he's getting smarter and smarting every day. <laughs> but then why did I say you're going to be dumb when you, eat, when you watch TV too much? Because he will be losing out in a lot of things. He will be losing out in a social interaction. He will be losing out in an experience of learning with his peers and from his, his friends in church and also not only friends, from you. He will be losing out in experiences. As a matter of fact, that was something. His grandmother there in Korea, for some who don't know, right now for six weeks, and their grandmother, your grandparents are trying to take them out as, many, as much as possible. 
And there was a week that he said, I don't want to go anywhere. I want to watch my iPad. And look at the experience that he might be missing out. It's not because he's really going to be dumb. Because we know that he's going to miss out. In the same way, not because we're really going to die because of the sin, but for us being spiritually disconnected with God, we're going to miss out on a lot of things. That's why God said, you're going to die if this happens. As a matter of fact, once they did it and that became an act of disobedience, they had started to know the things that they were not aware of. They wanted to hide from God like that little child hiding and covering her eyes, thinking that if she covers her eyes, her whole being is going to disappear in front of God. And a lot of times, that's what we do. The heart of disobedience makes us feel shame in front of God. And what do we do as a response? We hide, we tend to hide from God. What do we do? We hide by a result of ignorance. We don't want to see the deepest sin and the disobedience of our heart. So what we do is we cover it away. We don't want to look into our disobedience. We even come to a point saying there's no such God. It's all the religious hopes. We're trying to guilt us. And we cover it up under the carpet of our lives. But the other thing that we do, even as Christians, we try to hide from our busyness. So many times we try to do things outside of our world too much that we hide from that time to sit and listen to God's will. Am I only talking about the people who are striving outside? What about the people inside? By any chance, do we hide in our religious acts? Coming to worship, doing what I need to do in the church, and by doing all these things, thinking that I am not susceptible of this original sin, but by any chance in that religious mask, do we still do the things according to our own ways instead of God's ways? And by doing that, do we make more harm than we are actually benefiting others? We hide because of our disobedience. But God doesn't want us to hide. God makes a point to search for us. God makes a point for us to be freed from the disobedience and the distance that is created from there. And this is what happens. We see God entering the garden. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and the wife has hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God among the trees of the garden. Let me just stop here for a minute. Did God need to go into the garden again? Let me talk about God who we believe is almighty and who knows everything. Wouldn't God already know that they had eaten the fruit? Of course, you might ask, then didn't God know that they're going to eat it anyway? Why did God put the tree in? That's another discussion for another sermon. But let me just talk about this. When they ate the fruit, didn't God know about it? Yes or no? I think God knew about it. Then why did God come to the garden? God could have just said, you're done. You're a better test. You failed. Let me just wipe you up and start new. Wouldn't that happen? Doesn't God have the ability to make that happen? God made a point to come and walk to this garden. Not only that God did it after God had revealed all the disobedience that they had, God actually threw a cloth for them and God continued to provide for them after this sin. Not only that, God had sent God's Son to the world for them to be reconciled with God. And that's where the Bible continues on saying, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said. I heard the sound of you in the garden. This is what Adam says. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. 
When we are not fully obedient with God, we tend to hide ourselves. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And we see the God who even knew our disobedience, who is still willing to come and search out for us. It resonates with the story that we hear from Luke chapter 15 of the woman trying to search all her house to find a coin in her house. The coin that it might not be valuable enough. Like for us who recently moved out of the parsonage, when we were cleaning up the parsonage, I literally picked up a dollar worth of coins. It was not that valuable. I put it in my pocket. I don't even know if I put it in the piggy bank. It wasn't something that I had made a, made a move to even try to search for that coin that was lying around in the corners of our furniture. But we are valuable enough that God had made a way and sought out for us, searching underneath the cabinets and all the drawers, trying to find us because it's not about what we had done. It was more about how much God had loved us. And God sought out for us, searching underneath everywhere for us to do this, to experience the presence of God walking. And when God walks, not, being feel, not feeling shamed or guilt anymore, but to be truly immersed in the love and the grace that God has to provide, that God is promising, that God wants us to be in, in our everlasting kingdom. And the author of this book describes that love of that God searching for us and offering this to us when he says, when we come before our Creator in simple honesty, there is a response on God's part that help us to know that we are loved. We are given the knowledge that we are accepted just as we are. As a result, we don't need to pretend so much anymore. Or in other ways, we don't need to hide behind our mask. We can come out from where we have been hiding and start to relate more openly and freely. And that is quite liberating. The garden is a place and also a stage of our relationship where we are in true freedom and relationship with God. So when God was asking Adam and Eve, where are you? The same question can be asked to us. Where am I in that relationship? Where are you in that relationship with God? By any chance, are you still hiding behind ignorance, busyness, or even religion? Or are you able, and are we able to come simply to our Creator and experience that freedom that comes from God in the loving relationship that we can have on earth, which will be a taste of what we're going to have in heaven? That is why we want to invite you to truly meditate and chew onto this question and read the word in a different perspective to answer what God is asking us. One thing that I didn't share about how Wesley read the Bible is that he always read it with expecting God's revelation to him. But once he had received that revelation, he came to a group of believers and prayed together to verify and continue to discern how that revelation becomes alive in his life. And that's why we're here, to discern and answer that question together. 
as you ponder on this question, where am I? I pray that together we will find that answer with the help of the Spirit. Let us have a time of prayer. Where are you? As we hear your voice, as we hear your challenge, and as we hear your question for us, give us the heart to be open to your ways. Give us the heart to be obedient to your word. Give us the heart to continue to see how you are already with us, walking with us, and wanting us to be immersed in that love, immersed in that joy of your companionship on this earth until we come to your kingdom. So be with us as we search our hearts and we answer your question. We thank you and we pray this all in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen.